Hi, I'm Susan Maynard. Um, I will be reading the Dark Over series by Marianne Zimmer Bradley. I love those books and I have a lot of them. Um, I'm hoping at some point to get a fancy intro music thing a little bit and maybe a good banner, but I don't know how to do it, so I'll need my son's help. In any case, um, I'm going to be starting with this book, which is Dark Over Landfall, uh, when the whole thing starts, and um, proceed in, uh, chronologically through the many, many books that they have, and I hope you enjoy them because I love these books. Anyway, here's chapter one. The landing gear was almost the least of their worries, but it made a serious problem in getting in and out. The great starship lay tilted at a 45 degree angle with the exit ladders and chutes coming nowhere near the ground and the doors going nowhere. All the damage hadn't been assessed yet, not nearly, but they estimated that roughly half the crew's quarters and three-fourths of the passenger sections were uninhabitable. Already half a dozen small rough shelters as well as a tent-like field hospital had been hastily thrown up in the great clearing. They'd been made mostly out of plastic sheeting and logs from the resinous local trees, which had been cut with buzz saws and timbering equipment from the supply materials for the colonists. All this had taken place over Captain Leicester's serious protest. He had yielded only to a technicality, his orders were absolute when the ship was in space. On a planet, the colony expedition force was in charge. The fact that it wasn't the right planet was a technicality that no one had felt able to tackle yet. It was, reflected Raphael McCarran, as he stood on the low peak above the crushed spaceship, a beautiful planet. That is, what they could see of it, which wasn't all that much. The gravity was a little less than Earth's and the oxygen content a little higher, which itself meant a certain feeling of well-being and euphoria for anyone born and brought up on Earth. No one reared on Earth in the 21st century like Raphael McCarran had ever smelled such sweet and resinous air or seen faraway hills through such a clean, bright morning. The hills and the distant mountains rose around them in an apparently endless panorama, fold beyond fold, gradually losing color with distance, turning first dim green, then dimmer blue, and finally to the dimmest violet and purple. The great sun was a deep red and the color of split, spilt blood. And that morning they had seen the four moons like great multicolored jewels hanging off the horns of the distant mountains. McCarran set his pack down, pulled out his, the transit and, and began to set up his tripod legs. He bent to adjust the instrument, wiping sweat from his forehead. God, how hot it seems after the brutal ice cold of last night and the sudden snow that had, been, had swept from the mountain range so swiftly they had barely had time to take shelter. And now the snow lay in melting runnels as he pulled off his nylon parker and mopped his brow. He straightened up, looking around for, a convenient, for convenient horizons. He already knew, thanks to the new model altimeter, which could compensate for different gravity strengths, that they were about a thousand feet above sea level, or what would be sea level if there were any seas on this planet, which they couldn't yet be sure of. In the stress and dangers of the crash landing, no one except the third officer had gotten a clear look at the planet from space, and she had died 20 minutes after impact while they were still digging bodies out of the wreckage of the bridge. They knew that there were three planets in this system, one an oversized frozen methane giant, the other a small barren rock, more moon than planet, except for its solitary orbit, and this one, 
They knew that this one was an Earth, what Earth Expeditionary Forces called a Class M planet. Roughly Earth type and probably habitable. And now they knew they were on it and that it was that was just about all they knew about it, except what they had discovered in the last 72 hours. The red sun, the four moons, the extremes of temperature, the mountains, all had been discovered in frantic intervals of digging out and identifying the dead, setting up a hasty field hospital, and drafting every able-bodied person to care for the injured, bury the dead, and set up hasty shelters while the ship was still uninhabitable. Uninhab Sorry. Raphael McCarran started pulling out his surveying instruments from his pack, but he didn't attend to them. He had tended to this brief interval. He had needed this brief interval alone more than he realized. A little time to recover from the repeated and terrible shocks of the last few hours. The crash and a concussion which would put him on a hospital on crowded, medically hypersensitive earth. Here, the medical officer hurried, uh, hurried, harried from worse injuries, tested his reflexes briefly, handed him some headache pills, and went on to the seriously hurt and dying. His head still felt like an oversized toothache, although the visual blurring had cleared up after the first night's sleep. The next day, he had been drafted, with all the other able-bodied men, not on the medical staff or the engineering crews in the ship, to dig mass graves for the dead. And then there had been the mind-shaking shock of finding Jenny among them. Jenny. He had envisioned her safe and well, too busy at her own job to hunt him up and reassure him. Then, among the mangled dead, the unmistakable silver-bright hair of his only sister. There hadn't even been time for tears. There were too many dead. He did the only thing he could do. He reported to Camilla Del Rey, be, uh, deputizing for Captain Leicester on the identity detail, that the name of Jenny McAaron should be transferred from the lists of unlocated survivors to the lists of definitely identified dead. Camilla's only comment had been a terse, quiet, thank you, McCarran. There was no time for sympathy, no time for mourning, or even human expressions of kindness. And yet Jenny had been Camilla's close friend. She'd really loved that damn Del Rey girl like a sister. Just why, Raphael had never known, but Jenny had. And there must have been some good reason. He realized somewhere below the surface that he had hoped Camilla would shrink shed for Jenny the tears he could not manage to weep. Someone ought to cry for Jenny, and he couldn't, not yet. He turned his eyes on the instruments again. If they had known their definite latitude on the planet, it would have been easier. But the height of the sun above the horizon would give them some rough idea. Below him, in a great bowl of land, at least five miles across, filled with low brushwood, and scrubby trees, the crashed spaceship lay. Raphael, looking at it from this distance, felt a strange sinking feeling. Captain Leicester was supposed to be working with the crew to assess the d damage and estimate the time needed to make repairs. Raphael knew nothing about the workings of starships. His own field was geology but it didn't look to him as if that ship was ever going anywhere again. Then he turned off the thought. That was for engineer that was for the engineering crews to say. They knew and he didn't. He'd seen some near miracles done by engineering these days. At worst, this would be an uncomfortable interval of a few days or a couple of weeks, and then they'd be on their way again and a new habitable planet, habitable planet, excuse me, would be charted on the Expeditionary Forces stair maps for colonization. This one, despite the brutal cold at night, looked extremely ha habitable. Maybe they'd even get to share some of the finder's fees, which would go to improve the Coronis colony. 
where they'd be by then. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop that there. It's 10 minutes. And um, we'll start on the next chapter. Um, again, hope you enjoy it if you have comments. Um, and I'm sorry I don't have fancy, you know, introductory stuff, but I hope the, um, the story will make up for that. Take care. Have a wonderful day.